Let's restart the class. <coughs> so, who here has taken the class from Madel on the Indian business custom and culture? You guys did? So you're going to tell us about India. What did you learn in the class? You write down on the board. Tell me some things you learned. A lot of cultures. India has a lot of cultures. And languages. Different languages. Different languages and cultures. So India is not just like one country, it's like a lot of different countries. Anything else? Religions. Anything else? That's it? 15 weeks studying. <laughs> India has different cultures, languages, and religion. What was your question? What was your question? My question was for the students who studied the course about Indian business culture. Oh, Tell us about you, India. When you do business with an Indian uh, company, you have to make. Um, it will take a lot of time. It takes a long time. You have to make a relationship. Yeah. You have to be patient. Yes. Anything else? Hello. Second biggest population. Second biggest population we saw already, yeah? Yeah. yeah. One more thing. Maybe infrastructure is not that well established. Infrastructure needs improvement. Yes. And also education. Hmm? Oh, also education. Education can also be improved. Okay. So, just like China. India in the 90s started privatization. Does everybody understand privatization? A lot of the developing emerging economies were either run by dictatorships or communist regime before the 90s. Now they changed privatization. Privatization means selling the state assets to private companies. So one of the problems with socialism is that the people didn't have enough incentive to do a good job. So do you understand incentive? It's the same in Korean. So if I'm in the government company, so maybe I have no incentive, then I just sit in my office playing solitaire all day. Do you know solitaire? Solitaire, it's a card game, right? And I just say, oh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, right? So they found out the state-owned company might not be run so efficiently. So it may be better to make it a private company for certain things so that people have more incentive to work hard and make profit. Okay? With the state-owned enterprise anyway, they're going to get paid. Right? And they can't get fired. Very hard to get fired. Maybe they got the job because their sister was married to the guy. Right? So they can't get not going to get fired. But if it's a private company, just the, the idea of capitalism, okay? They need to work a little bit harder and try to make some profit. So it's the same in India. They're changing their state-owned companies to privatization. Okay? Example here is telecom, telecom sector. Okay? Uh, they're signing new trade agreements with the US to stop the quotas. They're planning to opening up these markets. Uh, long distance phone services, housing, real estate, and retail sectors to FDI. But India still is a challenging place. It has high tariffs, very high tariffs, not good protection of IP, and some anti business attitude. So, uh, India used to be a colony of Britain, so they don't, they don't, they have a bad attitude towards the foreigners coming in, because the British were not very nice, right? Uh, so, 
Uh, they had a bad experience with the British. The British just came in in the British Empire and just took everything. Colonialism, right? They did the same to Ireland and to other countries. Okay. So it means that they can have some, uh, sometimes the attitude against the, especially the farm business. Okay. We have a strong, we looked at the Transparency International, widespread corruption and bribery can also take place in, in India. But it has a lot of opportunities, okay? Big market, cheap labor, and qualified labor, knowledge of English, uh, educated middle class, a lot of college graduates, especially in information technology. Uh, India is very strong in information <coughs> technology. We can see here. So, and the time zone for India is uh, good for Europe. So do you have any other comments about India? You remember anything? So uh, we have the Asia Pacific Trade Associations, like ASEAN, somebody mentioned ASEAN already. So the goal of ASEAN is to make it a free trade area with no tariffs. Okay. Uh, some centralized distribution, rather than having to send our goods all over the place because of tariffs. <coughs> so we can do also more central marketing in, for ASEAN. We can look at ASEAN as one area that we can do the marketing for. APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. It uh, allows the governments to discuss about these things, economic collaboration, regional growth and development. Okay. So do you have any questions then about this section? We finished this section on the different regions in the world, different trade agreements and regions we have. Okay. And let's move on to the next topic. <clears throat> Market entry and planning. So first we'll talk about you know, companies that are planning to enter the market. Then we'll talk about the different ways we can enter the market. And after that we'll do some case study of uh, L'Oreal and look at L'Oreal's planning and how they enter the different markets and also to review the topics that we studied earlier we look at L'Oreal uh, how do they look at these different cultural environments and political environments in different countries so We'll talk about these things, the increased importance of strategic alliances internationally. Do you understand strategic alliance? What does strategy mean? It's a scheme or a plan to do something. Yes, and what's alliance? Alliance. Work together. Mm -hmm. Did you watch the new Batman and Superman movie? Yeah. No. Were they allied, allied or not? Finally they allied. Don't tell me. <laughs> but that's obvious, right? It's obvious they're not in the movie. That's why it's a Hollywood movie, right? Hollywood. They always win in the Hollywood movie. Do you ever sit there in the Hollywood movie and think, maybe Superman might die? <laughs> no? What? Sometimes they can break the back, they break the back of Batman and throw him under the ground, but he comes back and wins in the end. Right? So don't worry, it's okay. I already knew. So they have an alliance. So we can make an alliance with the companies. Then we'll talk about how we should plan to achieve the goal of the company and how to enter the different markets. So first of all, we need to decide on how are we going to divide up the market. It's called market segmentation. If you read an orange, you have the orange has maybe 12 different segments, 
right? Yeah. That's a segment. So we are making segments for the market. So should we divide the market on countries, on climate, on language, on media habits, on age, or on income? Okay? We can divide the market in different ways. Country, climate, just those countries all have the same climate. Okay? Language, they all speak English. Media habits then we're not looking at the country or the geography. We're looking at, we're marketing to people who use the internet all over the world, okay? Just internet users or smartphone users. Age, we're just marketing to 20 or 30 year olds. Doesn't matter about the country. Income, for Ferrari, Ferrari doesn't mind about the country. Ferrari sells the same car and the same product and very similar marketing all over the world, right? It just markets to people with a certain income. Maybe your income would be over a hundred thousand US dollars a year, right? Also, you know the watch uh, Rolex, okay? So they will advertise at the do their marketing at yachting. Do you know yachting? Yes. Yeah. Do you do yachting? No. Anybody have their own yacht? <laughs> no. What about polo? Do you play polo? No. They also go to the polo tournaments. It's a luxury. Hmm. They advertise on those things, right? Also, maybe golf, that kind of thing, right? So they are looking at the people who are involved in yachting or that kind of thing, right? They're similar, right? They meet each other, the yachting competition, oh, hello, hello, right? <laughs> they're from Argentina or England. Anyway, they, they're very similar, right? Yes. In fact, they could be more similar than the person in their own country. Maybe they would, if you ask the English guy, who would you prefer to be more associated with? The really rich Argentinian guy? Or a middle class English guy? You might say, no, no, I'm, I'm like the Argentinian rich guy. Ah, I'm not like the middle class guy in England. Okay? Yeah. So they might even see themselves as one market segment, different from the rest of the world. Okay? So the company has to decide about our marketing. Who are, what, how are we going to divide the segments? Then they need to decide about the standardizing, standardizing we talked about, uh, globalization or localization. Marketing always like customization, finance managers always like standardization. And we need to make a plan. We'll look at in the case study about L'Oreal, what's their strategy or plan. Nestle has a plan which is like this, they have four points on their plan. Think and plan long term. So they always make a long term strategy for the countries. Okay? Like 20 years, 10 years, or 20 years plan. Uh, decentralize. So don't have the head office in one country. They have a lot of offices all over the world. Stick to what you know. So they, they just try to do the business they're good at. Okay? For example, Nestle is good at quality control. Do you know quality control? So they go to a country, they can, they can buy the already existing company, like orange juice manufacturer, right? They don't have to change the, to another, to their own Nestle brand. They can keep the brand in that country. But what is Nestle good at? Quality control. So they can come in and buy the company, and they can make the quality of the product much better. Okay? So they know what they're good at, and they stick to that. And then adapt to the local taste. So, you know, something like juice. Do you think Nestle would be successful if they went to Poland with the American orange juice, American style orange juice? Or is it better to buy the Polish orange juice that people are used to drinking, have been drinking all their lives? Polish orange juice. Right? So people have the taste for the Polish one. So Nestle will, will adapt to the local taste. Okay? So let's say I have this kind of strategy or plan, four-step plan. <clears throat> These days, the trend of the strategy of the company is towards localization. Why? We have new efficiencies in customization. It's costing less to customize products. Do you know 3D printing? Yes. For example, 3D printing now makes it easier to make a new mold. So we can make a new, different size easily. Before it cost a lot of money to make a new mold, but now we can make a mold. Do you understand mold? If we're making something, we need a mold. We pour in 
plastic or the metal into the mold. Okay. The internet, we can uh, communicate more easily and we mentioned the manufacturing process is improved. From the marketing perspective, customization is always best. So Dell made the most customized uh, possible almost for the computers. So Dell was, you can't buy the Dell computer in the shop, okay? You have to order over the phone and you have to tell them exactly what you want, okay? They ask you, oh, are you a gamer? Yes, then okay, you need this graphic card or you tell them, I want a very good graphic card, okay? And then they're going to put the computer together just for you, okay? Then you can buy the computer that way. So that's very customized. So the customers are, can be happier with that, but of course it costs Dell more money to make the individual speci specific computer for each person with so much hard drive and graphic card and so on. <coughs> but, so if we look at finance and marketing, it's a battle, right? Marketing always wants more, as much customization as possible. But finance is saying, no, no, it's too expensive. It's not worth it. So when you're doing your marketing plan, you have to decide. First of all, we need to adapt our product, change our product for the country. Okay? Is it worth it? Right? We need to customize our product. Do you think it's worth it financially to do that? The co extra cost. Global markets, they are, we asked at the start of the class, do you think the markets are getting together more, like homogizing, or getting more different, people's tastes? But they're happening at the same time, okay? Like uh, Barbie doll, they made the mistake we mentioned before, they sold just the same Barbie doll all over the world with the blonde hair. It used to work well, maybe 20 years ago. You guys said you bought the Barbie 20 years ago, right? But nowadays, it doesn't work well. They're outperformed by Disney, who's selling customized doll for each country. <coughs> So the best companies avoid the trap of focusing only on the country as the primary segment variable. So we already looked at this idea of the globalization that Pepsi talked about, and uh, this is the Absolute Vodka again, another advertising campaign, okay, where they have all the different cities, New York with the bottle, and the same idea, but just customize the idea to the country. So we said that if we do the global marketing, we can get economies of scale. Do you know Black & Decker? Black & Decker make, do you know drills? The main maker of the drill in the world. Okay. So the drill is the same, really, all over the world. You don't really need to customize the drill. You understand drill? Yes. Yeah. For the different countries. So Black & Decker, or Gillette is another good example, right? Gillette make the razor kind of thing. Right? So they can get good competitive advantage here from economies of scale. We can get the transfer of experience and know-how by uh, doing in different countries. So uh, we have the access to the toughest customers. We mentioned that <coughs> Japan has the toughest customers in the world. So if I sell something in Japan, I get a lot of feedback from the customers and I can improve my product, improve my marketing when I go to another country. We talked about the diversification benefit. One country's economy is going badly, maybe in other countries is going well. So more countries, we have less risk. So planning <coughs> is making goals and then accomplishing the goal. So you're, making, you're going to make a plan for your project. Okay? So planning for international markets is trying to manage the effects of the outside uncontrolled factors on the, our companies. What is our company's strengths and weakness and objective in order to reach our purpose? <clears throat> so we have different levels of planning. Corporate is the top of the company, the CEO. Okay? They make very long-term visionary goals. Strategic planning is what we're talking about here, okay? It's kind of medium-term goal, products, money, research. Tactical planning, 
is more uh, at the local level. Okay, what should we? The tactic is like, oh, we need to change this or change that, right? I know we made this strategy, but now uh, we have some problems, so we need to change our tactics. <coughs> so this is the process that you'll use in your project. So we have the first phase. We just talked about earlier in the course, finding out about the companies, right, and the industry. We looked at the case of Sony, then the uh, political, legal, and economic environment, and the culture. Okay, so we understand all those things. Get an understanding of those things first. Then we need to adapt our product. We're going to talk about it later in the course. Adapt our product to the market. Okay change our promotion. We might have to do a different type of promotion in a different country. And distribution. And this is what we're talking about here. We're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. We're talking about this one now, right? We haven't done this yet, but here is developing the marketing plan. Okay, strategy and tactics, selecting how to enter the market. And then finally, we have the evaluation and control. Is our plan working well or not? Check. So this is the process of planning. So we can ask these kind of questions when we are deciding to adapt our marketing. Okay? Are there some identifiable market segments that we can use the same marketing across countries? Is there some segment that is very similar in the other market as our market? For example, let's say the young 20-year-olds, are they quite similar taste, right? If we're selling smartphones, right? Do they have the same taste as the, our country? Which cultural and environmental adaptations are necessary? So we, we look at the culture and the environment. What do we need to change? And the last question, we said we have to balance the finance and the customization. Can we still make a profit, even though we change all these things, or not? So the main part of what we're talking about today is market entry. So we have to think about these things when we decide on the market entry. How much sales we can make, how important it is, cultural difference, legal restrictions, okay? uh, our own company's capabilities. So let's look at some different uh, types of market entry strategy. So do you understand exporting? Yes. Right, then we have contractual agreement like license, strategic international alliance like joint venture, and then just direct investment. So we can use those different ways to enter the market. So we can see here, companies usually start here and finish here. So this is the least commitment. Okay? So here we can see uh, greater control and greater risk. So here we have more control, but we also have more risk. So you're selling, you start to make some bracelet company. So you get some, you start selling, you put a video on YouTube or something, okay? And you get somebody from Finland who wants to buy your bracelet. So you tell them, okay, then I'll send you the bracelet. Okay? That's the first part, just on the internet. Okay, then it's going well. A lot of people are asking you to send them bracelets. So you decide to start exporting. Okay, you send, start sending the bracelets around the world from your house. Then your company gets very, gets bigger, right? So you deal with an importer in another country and a distributor. Instead of just exporting directly to the customers, you export to the importer in the other country in bulk and then the importer sends out to the customers. Okay? Uh, then we're doing even better. People like the design. So I decide I'm going to do licensing. I'm, I have so many customers in Finland. Some Finnish company comes to you, sends you an email. Can I buy the license and start manufacturing your product in Finland? And you think, yes, I'm just a small company, so 
you make a licensing agreement, right? They have to pay you 10% of every product they sell, pay you 10%. Would you be happy with that? Hmm? Yes, you think, anyway, I'm not, I, I'm not going to develop market in Finland right now, so I'll sell them the license, okay? That's a contractual agreement. Then the strategic alliance, uh, you say, oh, US is a big market, I really want to sell my bracelets in the US, but I don't think I can do that by myself. So, find a US company, maybe a small bracelet company in the US, and we joint, make a joint venture, okay? So my company, US company, get together and make a new company, okay, company C. This company trades in the US. 50% my company, 50% the US company. Okay, US company wants to make the joint venture because they like the design of my bracelet. Okay, I want to join with the US company because they understand about the US market and marketing in the US. So we make our own new company. Then, this can be a joint venture. Then the most commitment, direct foreign investment. I build a factory, you go and build a factory in the US, right? Your bracelet is really popular, everybody in the world likes your bracelet. It's so like Sai, your YouTube video has one billion hits, right? So you decide, I'm going to make my own factories, okay? So I'm going to go to Europe and build a factory in Poland and sell my bracelets all over Europe, okay? So you use your own money to build a factory in Poland, direct foreign investment. So this is the levels of market entry that the company can choose from. Okay? This one is the greatest control and ownership. Right? Then we don't have much control here. And here we're just exporting. And so indirect exporting, we use a trading company or agent. Okay? Direct exporting, we export to an intermediary. <coughs> contractual agreements, we can have different types of contractual agreements. Licensing or franchising are the two main ones. So licensing is usually used for IP. Okay? Franchising is usually used for service industry. So franchising is used for hotels and fast food, that kind of thing. Licensing is used when we have some IP we want to protect. Okay? Why? It's not easy to protect IP. Okay? Especially if we are a pharmaceutical company. We talked about the case of the pharmaceutical company from the US selling drugs in Brazil. Then the Brazilian government started to manufacture, the, even the Brazilian government started to manufacture the drugs. Right? If that company was smart, maybe they would have sold the license to a Brazilian company. They already got their money, now it's the Brazilian company's problem. Okay? And then maybe the government might have a different attitude. Because it's a Brazilian company now who has the license, the government might have a different attitude. They might decide, actually we're not going to manufacture the drug ourselves. Okay? We already have a Brazilian company making the profit. So licensing, best example of licensing is you have a small company here, okay? and there's you're selling in another country far away, very different, okay? You have some IP, you have IP, okay? And you're worried about it, you're not going to be able to protect your IP. And anyway, you don't have enough money to do all the marketing and spend all the things properly, okay? So you're going to choose license. Meet somebody from that country, sell them the license to use your product often used in the pharmaceutical industry. Especially a young company. We don't have much money. If I want to do FDI, I need to build a factory here. It's going to cost a lot of money. I don't have much money. Okay? So it's a, a favorite strategy for small and medium-sized companies. It's a legitimate means of capitalizing on IP in a foreign product market. So I made an IP. I want to make money from my IP. Okay? So sell the license to people. It's fine. Licensing is often used by big, that's the typical case of licensing. But we'll see, we're going to talk about Zara. Zara uses licensing also, even though they're selling clothes. 
they use licensing where? In the Middle East. Why? In the Middle East, they have some legal, a lot of legal issues, right? They use the, we talked about the law. They use the Islamic law system in the Middle East. It's very complicated and it's hard for Zara to understand. And some of the countries, they're not big markets, they're small markets for Zara, right? Let's say a country like Qatar. Do you know Qatar? Yeah. Just a small market, okay? So anyway, it's not that big market. And then it's very complicated legal environment, right? So maybe it's better to use licensing. So the big companies can also use licensing. <coughs> franchising, can you name any company that's using franchising that you know? KFC, thank you. KFC, McDonald's. Anyone else? Hmm? Some, apart from the fast food? Samsung. Samsung, what franchising do they use? What do you mean? So you mean just retailing? Retailing. <coughs> That's good franchise. Mm, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> They're just selling the Samsung products, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, probably someone else owns it. They just pay royalties to Samsung. If there's a different store. Yeah, well, it could be that they could have that system in some countries. It depends on the country, right? They could have this, that kind of system. Okay, any other example? Starbucks. Yeah. Starbucks. Yeah. Restaurants. Yeah. Yes. Academies. And Academies. Yeah. Why do you think they use franchising for the service industry usually? Hilton hotels. Yes. Why do they use franchising for the service industry? So they have a high volume of this commerce brand and good reputation. Yes. Basically, they're selling their reputation, right? When we're with licensing, we're selling our IP, right? Uh, so, with franchising, we're selling reputation more so. So, in the case of Samsung, might be licensing. They might have some licensing in the, in the shops, right? But uh, here, we're selling our reputation. So if we can easily check, if we can easily check that the quality is okay, then we can use franchising. Because what we're worried about is our reputation, protecting our reputation. So the question is, can we easily check the quality or not? So of course the problem for any franchiser is for example, Hilton Hotels. <coughs> I sell you the franchise. You are now running Hilton Hotel in Seoul. Okay? And then the president of Italy is coming there, right? And you just come out and you say, Hey, who are you? What are you doing here? Oh, the president of Italy. Oh, oh okay. Just go to your room. Here's the big one. Quick. Right? Then the president of Italy says, Oh, I was in Korea and Hilton Hotel was terrible. I'm not using Hilton Hotel again, right? Do you understand that that's the risk for the Hilton Hotel, right? They lose their reputation or lose their image. So what, did, what can they do? Do you think they can easily check that the quality is okay in hotels <coughs> or not? Easily check? How can you check that the quality is okay in hotels? Hmm? How does Hilton Hotel check that the Korean owner of the franchise is doing it properly. Uh, inspection. Inspections, right? So if we can do inspections and checklists, we have checklists. Do you understand checklists? Yes. If we can do inspections and checklists easily and it works, that can check the quality, then we can do franchising. Okay? Franchising can be very profitable, like McDonald's. So what's going to happen? McDonald's is going to come once a month with a checklist, go around the kitchen, check everything, 
just maybe anonymous, anonymously eat the burger? Is it the right temperature? Okay, does it have the right ingredients? Yes, no? Then you, you lose the franchise, or you get some warnings, and you're going to lose the franchise. Okay, the same for the Hilton Hotel. So, franchise allows the company to grow very quickly, because they're not investing their money. The other people is investing the money. Okay? And they're just paying the fee to the franchiser. So, uh, they also provide a standard package of products, systems, and management services. So they, they sell their reputation, they also sell like know-how, right? So they give some special sauce, like McDonald's has some special sauce on the burger. They'll tell you the ingredients, okay? They'll tell you the system for the human resources, okay? They'll teach you the human resources system, or IT systems. They give you the market knowledge, and they are personally involved in management. They'll come to your company and help you with your management. This is the fastest growth market entry strategy. Because, like I said, other people are using their money. They are buying the property, they own the property, or they're leasing the property, not you. Okay, it's a big cost leasing the property. Okay, they're, they're uh, paying the costs. And also it's quite profitable because it's low risk. Franchising is low risk, just like licensing, okay? Can you lose money much on franchising? Not really. You invest the money on this, setting them up, and the checks, okay? But you get the fee. Probably the fee is going to cover this, okay? So it's hard to lose, even if the company does badly and goes out of business, you don't have to give the fee back to the owner. The owner already paid you the fee. So it can be a fast way to grow. Uh, we have contract manufacturing or outsourcing. Okay, so uh, this is the, just, do you understand outsourcing? So like IT is often outsourced. So it's not, we don't hire people in our company, we get another company and we make a contract and they do that part of the business. So they can provide the technical specifications to the company and ask them, Prepare this, make this for me. So company, many companies can focus on contract manufacturing. So for example, Apple use uh, contracts in China. Do you know Foxconn? Foxconn? It's a big company which manufactures a lot of the iPhone, right? But that's just, Apple just makes contract with them, okay? So Apple is not doing the FDI in the Fox, they are, instead of Apple doing the FDI and making the manufacturing plant, they just make a contract with Foxconn, a company in China. Okay? The company in China invests all the money in the factory, and Apple tells them, this is what I want. I want a smartphone. Here's the directions. Okay? Make the smartphone. Okay? And they say, they say, great, thank you for showing me how to make the smartphone, right? Now I'm going to make the smartphone. And? I'll sell it to you. Okay, so we make a contract and an agreement like that. Okay, so that is another way. It's a, all of these ways is a lower commitment and lower risk uh, for the company because they have to sp spend less money. Also, the main the fashion industry, clothing industry works a lot on, on contract manufacturing too, right? So Levi's, Levi's just provide the brand name. Okay but they actually don't own the manufacturing. Manufacturing is owned by a company in China or in Hong Kong, okay? And that company makes contract with Levi's, and Levi's gives them the design. Make the jeans like this, okay? So Levi's doesn't own any manufacturing. All Levi's does, makes the design, gives the design to the manufacturers, okay? And then marketing, Levi's is good at marketing selling the jeans. <coughs> so, do you have any questions about uh, the licensing or franchising? Or contractual agreement? No? Then we can move on to something that's more commitment, joint ventures. So 
So this is a partnership between two or more parties in a particular market. So we talk about if you're with a joint venture, we make a new company. We have company A and company B. And now we make a new company C. So we look at a case study yesterday, uh, in the future about Hyundai. Hyundai and the Chinese company, right? They, are, they made a joint venture when Hyundai entered China, okay? So this was called Hyundai Beijing Motors. Maybe this was called, let's say, Beijing Motors, okay? So we make a new company with a different name, okay? Hyundai Beijing Motors. Does everybody understand joint venture? 50% Hyundai, 50% Beijing Motors. Who's going to get the profits? Both. All companies are going to get the profits. 50%, 50%. Who's managing the company? Both. All people are managing the company. Okay. What's the advantage for Hyundai? Why do you think Hyundai made, didn't just set up their own factory in China? Why did they make a joint venture? Because of policy. What policy? Uh, government policy. Maybe they don't allow uh, foreign companies to run their government and health. Yeah, so they I, give some like a, uh, yes. um, critical uh, conditions. Yeah, so maybe this, in 2002 you're not even allowed <coughs> to, to do your own. You have to make the joint venture if you want to do business in China, right? According to the law. Any other reason? It's a pretty strong reason. It's easier to enter the new market. It's easier to enter the new market, okay? Why is it easier? Hmm? Lower the risk. I get 50% of the profits, but if, the, if I lose money, it's the same. I, I get 50% of the loss. So already I've reduced my loss by 50 I may have reduced my profit by 50%, but I've reduced my loss by 50%. What about the Chinese company? What's the advantage of joining with Hyundai? You know, the local market, uh, The Chinese company knows the local market, but I mean, why do they want to make an agreement with Hyundai? They get their technical Technical information, design, um, global brand name. The brand value is very important, so they can also, the Chinese companies can make, uh, can make a profit, but also they can learn uh, power technologies. Learn the core technology, yes. What do you think? Would Chinese people prefer to buy a Chinese-made car or or Korean-made car? Chinese. Korean-made car. As many, if the car is made in Korea, it must be much more popular than you know joint ventures like products. Mm. So, like that advantage, right? Global brand name. So people will think Hyundai is better quality. So they, both of the companies get the advantage. Okay. So they can share the risk by making a newly created business entity. So we partner with a local company, okay, and it allows us to learn about a new market with lower financial and political risk. Of course, Beijing Motors is going to give us some very good advice about marketing and <coughs> distribution, all those things. Distribution is another important factor. Okay? They may have some connection with the distribution center. There was one of my classmates from Mexico, my master's degree, he wanted to sell beef in China because he thought he's, his family owns a big ranch in Mexico with a lot of beef. Uh, so he wanted to export to China, but his problem was distribution channel. He couldn't find anybody to distribute the meat. Do you understand? So maybe if he made a joint venture with the Chinese company, then he could get a distribution channel and solve the problem of the distribution channel. So he needs to sell his meat in the supermarket, right? But what if the supermarkets don't want to buy his meat? Then he may have a problem. So uh, we joint ventures have these characteristics. They are separate legal entities. So this is not, it's legally individual new company, okay? If this company goes bankrupt, that's this company's problem, not this company or this company. Okay? This one just fails. We lose our investment. Okay? The partners share the management. 
Uh, we can have joint ventures not just between private organizations, but also governments. And we can have government and companies joining together. So each of the par partners should own the equal equity, 50%. Consortia. Consortia just means more. So we have more, more here than just two, three or four or five. Okay. Uh, it involves just a larger number of participants. We all put together our financial and management resources to lessen the risk. So uh, we can think of this as airlines. Do you know airlines? We have like Star Alliance. So four or five airlines join together to make some alliance. And uh, they can make some kind of uh, points. You get points with, when you fly with one airline and you get points when you fly with the other airline. So that's just a kind of strategic alliance. So with technological advances, falling trade barriers, and a growing belief that globalization is inevitable, companies are getting more innovative about their partnerships. So they're getting, companies are making more and more partnerships these days, okay? Communications are easier. Anyway, we have globalization, so we have to do something. If we just stay at home and do nothing, somebody could come to our country, okay? And we could be out-competed. So we have to go out and do something. So airlines use the Global Alliance. They, often, they offer the frequent flyer miles, access to benefits. They can have improved customer service, like they use just the one VIP, you know, the VIP lounge in the airport. Have you ever been in the VIP lounge in the airport? Never tried to get in? No? So anyway, they can put their money together on those things. So then the last one is direct foreign investment. So direct foreign investment has two main types. Uh, one of them is an acquisition or uh, so-called brownfield investment and greenfield investment. Okay. Uh, do you understand brownfield and greenfield? <coughs> Brownfield is the land is is ploughed, right? Do you understand plough? Yeah. Ploughed land, it's all brown colour. So somebody already worked. Greenfield is all grass. Okay? So brownfield means something already happened. Okay? Greenfield means nothing happened. Greenfield is start from the beginning. Okay, so we can start ourselves, buy the land, okay, and do everything ourselves, that's Greenfield. But we can buy a company which is already there, already has done something. Like we gave the example of Nestle in Poland. Nestle bought the orange juice manufacturer in Poland. Okay, so that's called an acquisition or a merger. Company enters the foreign market. We already have the facility, the factory, the operations, relationships, expertise, and brand names. That's easier. Okay? Greenfield investment, we create our own business entity from the ground up. Okay? Both of them are FDI. How much, how much of a company do we need to acquire before it's called FDI? What do you think? Do we need to buy 100% of the company to be called FDI? What do you think? How much? Let's say I bought one percent of a company. Is that FDI? No. no. So I just the amount it costs me to get effective control of the company. Sometimes just ten percent could be effective control. You could be the largest stockholder with just ten percent of the company. Okay. You could be the largest stockholder with twenty percent, with thirty percent, with forty percent. Okay. So if we acquire the company. It doesn't mean we have to buy 90% of the stock. Okay, we can just get the control of the company, the amount of stock that it costs to get control of the company. So then I think we're at the end of the time today.
So the next class we'll just finish talking about the market entry. Uh, we're just at the end, okay? And we'll start to look at the case study of L'Oreal. So you have the case study on the uh, on the geishi pan. So what I normally do for the case study is uh, I give assigned students just one part to read. Um, it may not make much sense because you know you didn't read all of the case, but just you tell us the main points of the part that you read, and then we can work on that uh, together in the class. So let's just assign uh, some. So if you go to the Geishi Pan, you can see in the cases, and you can download the the readings here. And here we can see L'Oreal as a PDF file. So just I'll, I'll uh, just assign, just write down in the page that you should read, right? Parts, so uh, Sim, Shim, Song Min. You can read this on page one, just the introduction part. Selling the Science of Beauty Around the World, uh, Kim Ye Ran. Just here, part one, and then here to part two. The organization of L'Oreal, uh, Ernest, just a short part. So organization on page two. So if you just write down organization on page two, then you'll remember. Okay. Uh, local consumer understanding, uh, you can uh, read this part. Okay, what you do is just read it and just write three sentences. What is the key point of this? Key po main point of this one. Then I'll ask in the class and I'll write on the board the main point. Okay. Uh, brand diversity. Uh, yeah. Brand diversity is on page three. <laughs> Maybe it's marketing. Uh, Kim Bon Suk on page four. Regionally focused rollout. Kim Wei Min on page five. Telling the story. Uh, Trey Jin Young. Trey Jin Young. Where is Trey Jin Young? Not here. Not here. Uh, then Sung Kyung Hu. Yes, you can do that one. Telling the story. Fame by association. Kim Yu Jung. So you can leave if you want after I tell you your your part, right? Marketing as recruiting. Uh, Im Tae Kyun. Is Kim Yu Jung is not Yu Jung is not here? Uh, yeah, so Im Tae Kyun, marketing as recruiting. Then what, pa page, what page is it? Uh, it's page seven. So uh, fame by association is uh, Pak Jinu. Fame by association on page six. From print to digital, uh, An Ho Wan, page seven. Reaching the next billion customers, Wang Wan Chi. Then working back, Kim Da Gyeong, uh, also from print to digital on page seven. Marketing is recruiting, Ha Hee Mu, page seven. Go on E, fame by association, page six. Young Min Lee, telling the story, page five. Regionally focused rollout, Moon Ju Wan, page five. Han So Young, maybe it's marketing, page four. Kim Ao Rong, brand diversity, page three. Kim Yuna. Local consumer understanding, also page three. Pak Jong Won, 
uh, organization, page two, Emir Rang. Selling the Science of Beauty, page one, Zhang Yang He, uh, the introduction part. Zhang He Jin, Selling the Science of Beauty, Kim Sang He, Organization, page two. Uh, Choi Tae Min, is Choi Tae Min here? No. Not here. Uh, Yang Sung Wan, Local Consumer Understanding, page three. Joe Am, Brand Diversity, page three. Im Young U, maybe it's marketing, page four. And that's all. Okay. So just read your part and make some three sentences. And then tell us in the next class, okay? <laughs> Website and I don't know about the other teachers, but maybe they have something. Portal.suon.ac. Just www.suon.ac.kr. Ah. 